Hey, good day and good morning. Uh, we're going to go over the Mughal Empire today, and then I'm going to also give you the instructions for your uh, research uh, source evaluation. Uh, okay, I want to start first with the Mongols. Uh, they're kind of like the foundation of this entire lecture here. Um, the Mongol tribes, uh, they're united in the late 1100s by Genghis Khan. Uh, his real name is Chinggis Khan, but we've kind of made it say Genghis these days. Uh, originally, he was known as Temujin, and conservative estimates uh, state that Genghis Khan was responsible for mass exterminations, famines, and the direct death of nearly 20 million civilians. He's very, very uh, good at killing, let's say. Um, Genghis Khan also uh, slept with a lot of people. In fact, he has over 20 million living descendants, which is about 0.5% of the entire world's population. Um, Genghis, he reorganizes the Mongols. Uh, he weakens the family ties. He spreads wealth to those who are loyal to him. So it's not about who you're related to. It's about how you help him that gets you in, in charge. Uh, he decrees religious freedom. He supports international trade. He exempts the poor from taxation. And, believe it or not, uh, Genghis Khan, he encouraged literacy amongst his people. Uh, the Mongols, they even had a functioning mail system. Each messenger in the Mongol mail system would ride about 25 miles from one station to the next. Each relay station had households that were serviced by it, kind of like a post office today. All total... The Mongol mail system had over 1,400 postal stations, over 50,000 horses, 4,000 carts, and something like 6,500 boats. The Mongol military was really big, especially for its day. It had over 100,000 soldiers in the early 1200s, and it was based on the decimal system. Each squad was a squad of 10 soldiers. Military specialists were recruited from the lands they were conquered from. Uh, the soldiers were lightly armored. Everything was based on speed, and the horses, or each soldier had multiple horses that they traveled with. So when one horse got tired, they just swapped to a different horse. Whenever the Mongols attacked somebody, uh, they would offer the enemy the opportunity to surrender and pay money. If they accepted, they were spared, but they had to support the Mongol army with manpower and supplies. If they refused, though, they were just completely destroyed. Uh, the Mongols would let a few civilians escape so they could tell others about the death and destruction of the Mongols. And it's this psychological warfare that's really going to precede the Mongols and help them conquer large swaths of territory. Eventually, uh, when Genghis Khan dies, his empire will be divided into four smaller empires. And that's uh, going to be China, the Golden Horde, the Khanate of Persia, and then the Chagatai Khanate. <clears throat> a couple years later, uh, kind of born out of this desire to rebuild the Mongol Empire with a focus on Islam, this guy named Timur the Lame, or Timurlane. Let me move my picture here so you can see what he looks like. There he is. Timurlane is going to come to power in the year 1380. Now, Tamerlane, he begins his quest for power by claiming he's a direct descendant of Genghis Khan, and he conquers land around his hometown of Samarkand, which you can see listed right there. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, some of the places he's going to conquer are Persia, Afghanistan, northern India. He doesn't stop there. His goal is to rebuild the Mongol Empire. Uh, Tamerlane, he treated cities that surrendered peacefully to him with respect, but he would completely destroy those cities that resist him. And to show how powerful he was, this guy even built pyramids out of skulls to show his force. Uh, Tamerlane's kingdom, it does not outlast him. When he dies, his kingdom is going to fall apart. So that brings us now, let me skip this. to the Mughals. Now, the Mughals, they're 
Muslim leaders of northern India who ruled over Hindu kingdoms. That's what a Mughal was. It's a Muslim leader in northern India who ruled over a kingdom of Hindus. Originally, it was part of the Safavid Empire. It's eventually going to become a separate thing. And the Mughals are going to control parts of Afghanistan, parts of Pakistan, and then most of northern India. And overall, they're going to be very wealthy due to their con due to their control of, of trade routes and supplies. Now, the first Mughal is Baber. And Baber is going to conquer Samarkand in the year 1497 and begin to recreate the empire of Timur, the empire of Tamerlane. Now, here's where things get interesting. Baber is a direct descendant of both Tamerlane and Genghis Khan. So he can say, yes, I am related to both. And he believes that it's his destiny to control power, both politically and militarily. By his death in 1530, Baber is going to control all of northern India. He's going to control parts of modern-day Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Now, overall, uh, he's not a big fan of the Hindu caste system. And he's not a big fan of Hinduism either. And he dies in 1530 because of an unknown illness, and he's replaced by his son, Humayun. Now, according to legend, and remember, this is just legend, Baber bargained with Allah to take his life instead of his son's. And supposedly, his son, Humayun, was very sick and expected to die. And after making the deal, the son started to get better, while Baber started to get worse and worse and worse. Uh, Baber eventually dies when Humayun is completely healed. So... Humayun takes control of the empire after his dad dies. And Humayun, he's more interested in poetry. He's more interested in astrology. He doesn't really care about governing this empire. Uh, in fact, he builds a giant library, which is this picture here, called the Sher Mandal. Um, he faces a revolt from this Afghan leader named Sher Khan, who is able to unite parts of Humayun's family against him. And there ends up being a civil war that lasts over 15 years. Uh, Humayun, <coughs> he's going to die in 1556. How does he die? He's carrying a stack of books, and he falls down the staircase of his, his uh, library. So don't let anybody tell you that books can't kill you. Just point them to Humayun and say, look, this guy died because of library books. Now, once Humayun is died, he is going to be seceded by his own son, Akbar. And Akbar is going to begin conquering even more territory than either his dad or his grandfather. Now, Akbar inherited Humayun's love of books, but he couldn't read because of dyslexia. So what Akbar would do is he would have others read books to him. So he was still very well, well uh, read and very knowledgeable. He was a fan of the European Renaissance. He invited Europeans to visit his kingdom. And this included Akbar meeting officials from the British East India Trading Company, which conveniently is going to be like the beginning of European colonization and British colonization in India. We just don't know it yet. Akbar, he observed religious tolerance and tried to end all the religious wars in his kingdom. He even married a Hindu princess in addition to Muslim women to bring people together. And at Akbar's death, by the way, he had over 800 wives. Now, even though he was religiously tolerant, the Muslim and Hindu princes underneath him, um, they resisted attempts to conquer, and they resisted his attempts of bringing people together. Now, the Mughal Empire will start to decline after the death of Akbar. Uh, around the year 1600, Shahangir, who is the son of Akbar, rebels against his father and took over the empire. And then, almost like a bit of irony, Jahangir, one of his own sons, tried to overthrow him as soon as he got control. So it's a, not a very stable empire at that point. Uh, Jahangir is well-educated. He could speak four languages, but he's more interested in drinking and gambling than he was being a good ruler. And while Jahangir is busy just having fun, his wife, a woman named Nur Jahan, is going to end up taking control of the government and appoints many of her own male relatives to government posts. Uh, after Jahangir's death, his son Shah Jahan becomes the emperor, and Shah Jahan is going to throw his mother, Nur Jahan, into prison. 
Shah Jahan, by the way, he ends he ends his he ends a lot of the religious tolerance policies that his dad and his grandfather had put in place, and he institutes strict Islamic policies and laws, which starts to fracture the empire. Uh, Shah Jahan, he's very famous for building both the Jama Majid Mosque as well as the Taj Mahal. And the Taj Mahal, by the way, that is the tomb for his favorite wife, a woman named Mumtaz Mahal. Now, Shah Jahan's sons are going to fight each other when they think their father is on his deathbed. Three of the four sons die, and the surviving son, Aurangzeb, becomes the leader of the Mughal Empire. Ironically, though, uh, Shah Jahan gets better and Aurangzeb is like, well, I have to throw my dad in prison now because he's still alive. And so Shah, Shah Jahan is going to be his son's prisoner for the next five years until he does pass away. Now, Aurangzeb, he's going to increase the Islamification of India. He's going to institute strict Sharia law. And he doesn't force people to convert to Islam, but he gives gifts and he gives political positions to any Hindu who converts to, to Islam. Uh, he's a dedicated Muslim. He's openly hating Hindus. He will eventually prohibit the Hindu religion. Starting in 1679, um, Aurangzeb is going to put special taxes on Hindus. Hindu temples will be demolished. He creates a moral police force that requires citizens to prove if they're, they're Muslim or not. And then he passes a law that says all women must marry or they'll be put to death. By the death of Aurangzeb, he's totally hated by everybody. And the empire really falls apart because when Aurangzeb is, is gone, the Persian Empire starts to attack and the British East India Trading Company starts to spread its influence within India. So here's a depiction of what the Mughal emperors looked like right here. I'm going to skip this too. Now what was Mughal society like uh, politically? There are four ministries. There's the Minister of Military, the Mil Ministry of Tax and Revenue, the Ministry of Legal and Religious Affairs, and then the Ministry of the Royal Household. Below this were provincial governors, and they reported directly to the emperor. And then there are nobles who had the best military and administrative skills who are going to be promoted and given the most land. And then those nobles, in exchange for being promoted, they're going to send their tax money directly to the emperor. On the economic side of things, originally their economic system was based on agriculture. Um, and government officials would actually calculate how much harvest each part of the empire is supposed to give based on like what their expected output was and then how many people live in that area. And that's how they would get their expected tax obligations. It was very progressive for the time. Uh, trade relations with the international East India trading companies, the Dutch East India trading company, uh, the French added trading company, and then the British, brought in a lot of international stuff to the Mughal Empire. And also Mughal goods are going to be spread around the world as a result as well. As far as family goes and religion, uh, daily life, it revolved around the caste system and clans, just like it did during Hinduism. Even though in the Mughal Empire, you're not supposed to have castes anymore. So even though the caste system is officially supposed to be gone, it does still persist unofficially. Uh, women spend most of their lives in seclusion from public. Uh, they run the households, they raise the children, and they stay out of the limelight. And then for most of the Mughal empire until we get to the end hindus were given legal protections and religious protections uh, for the most part hindus were allowed to continue worshiping their hindu beliefs until the very end um, but it doesn't mean it was easy i mean you had taxes placed on you and um, the leaders tr did everything they could to get you to convert to islam but when you come down to it really without the hindu support uh, the Islamic royalty, they would have been overthrown. Those Mughal emperors could not have ruled without support from the Hindus. Uh, Christians and Jews, by the way, they're protected in the Mughal Empire 
because they're considered people of the book. They're considered chosen people, just like uh, Muslims were. Uh, this protection and respect for Christians allowed for friendly relations between the Mughal government and European governments. And that's why uh, the trading companies were able to come in and do work. All right. I'm going to pause video for about 30 seconds. Of course, you won't know that. But when it comes back up, you will see um, the source evaluation. And I'll go over that real quick. It should take me about five minutes. Okay, as promised, I have everything up now. If you click on Lessons, and then if you click Research Paper Dropbox in Instructions, we are now on assignment number two which is to locate sources and then evaluate them. And if you click this link that says source evaluation dot doc X, it's going to pull up this source evaluation worksheet. And yes, this is a worksheet you will have to use because this is the worksheet that you are going to upload for me. So what do you actually have to do? Well, Everybody should have turned in a topic and abstract. Now what I need you to do is use our West Georgia Technical College librarians and Galileo to locate five sources that go along with your topic. And then for each of those five sources, I have some questions I need you to answer. This is something that is going to take more than 10 minutes you cannot do this last minute. You have to work on it a little bit all through the week. Now, some of the questions you have to answer. The first one is regarding authority. I want to know how you found the source. Did you go talk to a West Georgia Tech librarian? Did you look at Galileo? Did you do a simple Google search? Do you think that the method that you used was good or not? Tell me why. If it's an online source, tell me if it's part of a bigger website. If it's an online encyclopedia, tell me if it's part of a bigger encyclopedia. And then, who's the author? Look up the name of the author and tell me who it is. Then, tell me if you think the author is an expert. Some authors are obviously experts in their field, others you got questions about. The second thing is objectivity. You don't have to read the source, but do skim through it just a little bit. And then tell me if you think that the source is fact or opinion. And then tell me how you decided that. Accuracy. A good source is going to be researched. And I want you to look and see if your source appears to be researched. Does it cite its own sources? Would you be able to recreate the research if you had to? And then finally, currency. Was it published recently? Was it published a long time ago? And then finally, do you think that your source is good? Why or why not? So those are the five questions I need you to answer as you're doing your source evaluation. How did you find the source? Who's the author? Is the author an expert? Is the source fact or opinion? Is the source well researched? Is it a current source? Yes or no? And then finally, do you think it's a good source? Why or why not? All right, I'm going to minimize this and I'm going to pull up a web page real quick. This is our West Georgia Technical College library website. It's just westgatech.edu slash library, and we'll bring you to this page. Now, why am I doing this? Two reasons. Number one, well, I should say three reasons. Number one, locations and staff. If you didn't know this, each of our five main campuses has a library, and each of our five main campuses has librarians that staff it. These librarians, are trained to help you do research. So if you're researching World War II, if you're researching um, the Reformation, whatever it might be, these librarians can help you. You can call them, you can email them, you can visit them in person, and they will help you do that. And it does not matter which of the five libraries you visit, 
Just go to the one that is closest to you. The next really important thing is library resources right here. And if you click library resources, there will be a link that says West Georgia Technical College catalog search right here. Click on that. This brings you to the catalog search for our library. And you can search your topic here and see what we have in-house that could help you. Uh, for example, maybe you're doing some research on the Vietnam War. I type in Vietnam War and we come up with books. We've got 1,706 books that we have access to dissertations, journals, maps, you name it. And then you can also break it down by campus, Carroll Campus, Coweta Campus, Douglas, LaGrange, and our main campus is the Waco Campus. These are all online access books, meaning you can access them anywhere. This is a book that is at our main campus. You would have to go there to get it. Or, you know, let's say that there's a book that's at Waco and you're in LaGrange, we can have the book shipped to you. You just have to go and speak to your librarian. Another thing that we can do, a lot of people are not realized or don't know about, is we can get books from other libraries. So you can search all of the Technical College System of Georgia libraries. And if there's a book that's at like, I don't know, a Wiregrass Technical College, which is somewhere way far south, we can get you that book too. We just have to know the name of the book, who has it, and then you speak to the librarian to get it. The final thing I want to show you is Galileo. This is probably where most of you will do your research and I hope that you use it um, to complete this project. Always click where it says advanced search. It's just easier. Don't waste your time putting anything in that box. Just click advanced search. And Vietnam War and causes and United States. Oh. Let's see what we get. Online peer reviewed, online full text, and hit search. 60,000 results is a lot but we can always filter this down a little bit more if we needed to. You should be able, if you were doing the Vietnam War, you can find enough resources to do five source evaluations. Okay, now I don't want to make this too much longer. I hope this gives you the basics of what you need. And please, if you have any questions about this, send me an email so I can answer your individual questions. This is due 11.59 p.m. Sunday night, which is the 18th. All right. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you again soon. And I hope this answers questions that you may have regarding this assignment. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.